Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Virgin Wines PLC Interim Results Investor Presentation. Throughout this recorded presentation, investors will be in listen-only mode. Questions are encouraged and can be submitted at any time using the Q&A tab situated on the right-hand corner of your screen. Just please simply type in your question at any time and press send. The company may not be in a position to answer every question it receives during the meeting itself. However, the company review all questions submitted today, and we'll publish those responses where it's appropriate to do so. Before we begin, we'd like to submit the following poll, and your participation, I'm sure, will be greatly appreciated by the company. And I'd now like to hand over to CFO Graham Weir and CNO, CEO Jay Wright. Good afternoon. Great. Thanks very much, Mark, and um, welcome, and thank you all for coming along and being part of today's presentation. I'm going to start off chatting through just some of the, the highlights that we've seen in the first half of our financial year. And the trading environment has evolved considerably over recent months. And given strong prior year comparatives, we've worked really hard to maintain encouraging growth from our core sales channels, whilst maintaining strict discipline around our customer acquisition and our cost control. The result has demonstrated a number of things that give us continued confidence underlying the strength of the business model. We've shown the benefits of our subscription schemes with significantly increased revenues from a highly engaged customer base. We've maintained our discipline in acquiring good quality customers at low cost. We've continued to show our ability to convert profit into cash. And we've seen consistently high ratings from customers for both our range of wines and our customer service. Revenue for the six months to the end of December achieved 40.6 million in line with the previous year and up 55% on the same period in FY20. Our adjusted profit before tax was also broadly in line with the previous year at 3.3 million. Actually, there was just 46K between the year on year performances. Total membership of our subscription schemes increased to 158,000, up 7.2%, while subscription revenues leapt 23% year on year as those customers spent more with us. Net crap cash grew by 5.2 million to 13.6 million, and that excludes cash held from wine bank customer deposits. We know bringing in the quantity of new customers so far this year has been more challenging, but we've been pleased to see the conversion rate of new customers who go on to buy a second case has increased from 51.3% to 56.2%, a really substantial leap and showcasing the quality of new customers being acquired. On top of that, our commercial channel has gone from strength to strength with a number of new partnerships, including a key trading relationship with Moonpig, whilst we've also launched subscription schemes for our beer and spirit product categories, namely Beer Save and Spirit Save. To talk in more detail now about the financials, I'll pass you on to, um, to Graham. Hello. Um, Jay has taken you through the financial highlights, so not a massive amount to add on this slide, just to confirm that all the numbers are post our IFRS adjustments. Although the numbers are unaudited, they have been prepared on a con consistent basis with the annual report in June, and there are no changes to any accounting policies or key judgments. Uh, the comparatives do relate to the pre-IPO period, but again are produced on a consistent basis with the current numbers. And just to confirm that the revenue was unchanged at 40.6 million for the six month period and profit before tax was 3.2 million against 3.4 million. Earnings per share were down from six pence to 4.6 pence as a result of dilution due to the issue of over 8 million new shares as part of the IPO process in March uh, 21. Two things I wanted to, to pick out from the balance sheet are stock and cash. Uh, we made a decision over 12 months ago to invest in higher inventory levels by increasing both supplier lead times and holding more stock in our UK warehouses. This largely insulated us from the worst impacts of the supply issues most companies faced in mid to late 2021. Our stock holding has increased by 2.9 million since June. We keep this position under constant review and as supply issues start to ease, we will drop that back to more normal levels. The total cash on the balance sheet of 18.8 .8 million includes 5.2 million of wine bank customer deposits. These customer deposits are held in a separate ring fenced account, so we don't include them as part of our net cash balance. So net cash at December 
was 13.6 million. That's the 18.8 million on the balance sheet, less the customer deposits of 5.2. And that is up from 8.4 million in June 21. There are no loans in the business and the cash reserve allows us to grow the business through further investment in organic growth or potentially through M&A activity. We've covered the cash position in the previous slide, but just to reiterate that our business model allows us to generate fast cash returns with low capex investment and therefore give a good cash return to custom, uh, to, to shareholders. Uh, this is our profit before tax uh, bridge. We've seen very consistent year on year performance across the business, resulting in little overall movements in the profit before tax. Investment in new customer acquisition increased by just over 200,000. The net contribution from our repeat customers was marginally higher. And on the cost side, investment in overheads. PLC costs and share based payments were offset by savings in finance costs. Although little movement in the year, profit before tax was still 2.7 million higher than the H1 2020 period, demonstrating that the group has been able to hold on to the gains made over the last two years. We maintained good gross margin discipline over what turned out to be a very volatile and unpredictable period for cost inputs, such as inbound freight and packaging. Statutory gross margins, as shown on the income statement, are slightly down at 31.1% compared to 31.4%. This statutory gross margin is calculated after deducting the product costs, packaging and delivery costs it remains three full percentage points higher than H1 2020. Our product margin on core repeat sales, and that's calculated before packaging and carriage, only moved very slightly from 40.4% compared to 40.5% in the comparative period. And once again, uh, also well up on the 2020 equivalent. These numbers show that we have now cemented in the margin gains achieved over the last few years. Okay, do you want to have a take yep. us from acquisition? Thanks, Graham. So I mentioned in my summary um, of our H1 performance at the start that customer acquisition has been the most challenging area of our business, or rather bringing in the volume of new customers we've targeted whilst remaining highly disciplined in our approach of delivering low cost, high quality customers has been challenging. Clearly, the economic landscape has evolved substantially over the past two years, and forecasting consumer behaviour over this whole period has been particularly difficult. I think it's worth pointing out that when we headed into November, so four months into our financial year, we were still ahead in our customer acquisition numbers year on year. What we saw over the key Christmas trading period was a quite sharp decline in the willingness for new potential customers to engage with acquisition offers in the numbers we'd seen in recent times. Having said that, we always knew that consumer behaviour would change once more normal conditions returned, and as such, we delivered a significantly increased number of partner deals in H1 this year, up 55% on the year before, as we tried to counter lower visitor rates and aggressive pricing from competitors with increased acquisition activity. Whilst this strategy was successful in closing the gap, it didn't completely eliminate the shortfall against our forecasted levels. What we did ensure over this period was that we maintained our discipline around our costs, with the cost per recruit for the half year coming in at just £13.62, which in turn has ensured our payback levels have remained consistent, still at a five times return on investment over a five year time scale. It's also vital that we continue to bring in high quality customers that we can convert into loyal advocates of Virgin Wines for many years to come. So choosing the right partners to work with and not over discounting on our acquisition offers has been key in ensuring our conversion rates have continued to grow, moving up to 56.2% from 51.3% a year ago. Whilst it will be really easy to increase the cost per recruit and chase new customers, that will just cover up a short-term issue to create a longer-term problem. Keeping our discipline around cost and quality ensures we can focus on opening up new avenues to acquire greater numbers of customers, whilst knowing we've kept the key disciplines of our business model intact. 
to help drive increased customer growth, we're looking into a number of ways of achieving this. Most key will be our ability to target and secure larger scale partners, more in line with our relationship with the Mail and the Daily Mail Wine Club, where we have the ability to acquire four or 5,000 customers per year on an ongoing basis through a variety of communication channels over an annual marketing plan. We have a number of exciting conversations ongoing at the moment, and we're confident that we'll be able to bring some of these on board to have material influence over our customer acquisition numbers next financial year. In addition to this, we're also increasing the mix of digital, CRM and telemarketing activity within the overall customer acquisition plan, whilst maintaining our cost and quality profiles. So moving on to our um, subscription base, underpinning the success and growth of our business has been our ability to drive large numbers of new customers into our subscription channels, and in particular, our wine bank scheme, where customers are able to spread the cost of buying wine by saving each month, receiving 20% interest from Virgin Wines on each monthly payment that can then be used against future purchases. This is key in driving the predictability of future revenue as customers are continually building their wine bank balance that will then be used on purchases in the weeks and months to come. Sales generated by our subscription schemes grew 23% to 26.3 million in the first half of this year, compared with 21.3 million the previous year, and 14.8 million in H1 2020, an increase of 77%. Our wine bank membership continues to build, increasing by 11,000 customers, which is 9.3% in the past six months, whilst delivering a 28% increase in revenue year on year. Indeed, the subscription base has increased by 59% now since FY19. Across both our wine bank and wine plan subscription programs, it's clear to see that although the customer base is building, the average revenue per customer is increasing at a much faster rate. Between the first half of FY20 and FY21, customer growth was 18%, while average spend per customer over the six month period increased by 22%. Similarly, comparing the first half of FY21 with FY22, sees customer growth on subscription schemes of 7%, while average spend per customer increased by 15%. This once again highlights the loyalty of the base and the fact that customers are spending at an increased level. The balance of total customer deposits in Wine Bank continued to build with 5.2 million of customer money held at the end of December, up 42% on the same point the previous year. Again, this gives confidence in future revenue as this is customer money sat waiting to be spent on wine. And it's not just Wine Bank which is proving popular. Our wine plan customers have generated 15% more orders in HY22 than the previous year. And the average yield from those customers, which is basically the percent who received their quarterly case, has increased from 64.1% to 68.5%. So moving on to the performance of our repeat sales channels, the success, the success, success we have keeping our subscriber base and our pay-as-you-go customers active and our revenue increasing is down to the engagement, targeting, and relevancy of offer from our main back-end sales channels. These four channels, email, wine advisors, web, and wine plan, have grown 5.8% year on year, delivering sales in line with our original forecast. Email is our largest sales channel, and it continues to grow strongly, up 7.8% year on year, and up 75% on the first half of FY20. A continued focus on customer segmentation through data analytics is delivering incremental value, while our tactical use of SMS mes messaging can supercharge an email campaign response by as much as 20%. The Wine Advisor team now look after 50,000 customers, and they've delivered sales growth of 7.3% year on year. The engagement that these customers have with their Wine Advisors is second to none, and is clearly shown by the fact that they're our most loyal customers and deliver the highest average revenue per annum across the customer base. Web sales have been hit by the changing consumer dynamics with visitor numbers and sessions down year on year. Whilst this led to a 7.5% decline in revenue through the channel, the majority of the gains we made since 2020 have been maintained with sales up 85.8% through the channel against H1 2020. And finally, and as already mentioned, wine plan sales have been strong up 14.1% year on year, and over 49% up against H1 2020.
This is our highest margin channel and one of the lowest costs to fulfill. So it's an important driver of profit. I'd like to talk about our development channels now, as over the past few years, we've created additional sales channels that utilize our core competencies and our infrastructure, with around 20% of our total revenue now being driven through these areas. Our commercial or B2B channel has been particularly successful with sales up 25% year on year and 71% ahead of H1 2020. We focus on creating both solid year round partnerships with other businesses, with the launch of our relationship with Moonpig last September of particular note, as well as developing many existing partnerships, including a number of those with our Virgin sister companies, such as Virgin Money and Virgin Media. We also capitalized upon the opportunities that existed over the Christmas period, with many businesses looking to incentivize customers, reward staff, or thank commercial partners and, and finding wine, champagne, or hampers, a great way to do that. We've also benefited over the past few months by the opening up of travel again, as we supplied the wines for LNER and Avanti on the East and West Coast train lines. As we look to build the channel and efficiencies within it further, we're investing in our IT infrastructure to incorporate a partner portal that will give each of our corporate customers the chance to have their own individually tailored Virgin Wine shop where anyone authorised within their organisation is able to self-serve, as well as giving us the ability to host a general hub for any corporate client to come and use. This also builds on our relationship with Salesforce. This new service is planned to be live before the end of our financial year. Moving on to our gifts, we knew we had extremely high, extremely tough comparatives year on year, with online gifting being such a beneficiary of the COVID-19 based restrictions on retail, and the inability of people to visit friends and family in person over the 2020 Christmas trading period. This led to revenue from our gifting channel being down 27% against last year, although still 47% ahead against H1 2020. Our key advent calendar campaign still managed to deliver like for like sales against last year with 13,000 units sold, but we were negatively affected by a reduction in general Christmas gifting over the period. However, we're still really confident about the opportunities we have to scale the gift channel. In the next few weeks, we'll be launching a fully personalized gift service, which allows customers to create their own personalized wine labels. This is new functionality we've been working on for some time, and we see numerous ways to utilize this technology moving forwards, both in the gift channel and in our commercial team. We've also developed relationships with businesses where we can add different products to our gift range, and recent partnerships with Virginia Haywood, with, with hampers and arena flowers offer excellent new cross-marketing opportunities. And moving on to beers and spirits, we already stated that our objectives for the beer and spirit channel over this year was to start rationalizing the initial ranges. Now we had sales data from a reasonable period to increase the focus on our exclusive ranges to deliver higher margin opportunities and to de develop subscription schemes in these product areas. We were therefore delighted to launch our new beer save and spirit save subscription schemes in the latter part of the last calendar year. Operating on the same successful premise as Winebank, where customers save money each month in their beer save and spirit save account, they then receive preferential pricing on all products across their, these respective categories. This preferential pricing is also available as standard to all our 130,000 Winebank customers, with our focus in the short term on communicating this new initiative and scaling the beer and spirit categories to our existing customer base, where we believe there's still substantial headroom to grow. We've also begun the process of rationalizing both ranges. Now we have clear data on the popularity of the two categories, and this goes hand in hand with our continued development of our exclusive portfolio of products, as we look to build on the success of those already launched and mirror the popularity of our wine range within these sectors too. And now back to Graham for the next couple of slides. As a business, we work extremely hard to maintain what we understand are the lowest fulfillment costs in the sector. These costs include our warehouse pick and pack cost, customer services, packaging, delivery, and credit card fees. Despite the very obvious upward cost pressures, these costs actually fell from 12% of revenue to 11.9% during that uh, six month period. 
Operationally, our warehouse operations did suffer from high levels of staff COVID-related sickness in the few weeks before Christmas. And as a result, we had to bring forward our planned Christmas cutoff by two days to ensure we shipped all customer orders in time. This earlier than planned cutoff had a one-off impact on the business of around 800K in sales. We operate a dual carrier solution to reduce risk and consumer choice, um, but and, and give more consumer choice, sorry, not reduce co consumer choice. Um, both our carriers perform very well over peak trading and continue to do so. Our service continues to be rated excellent from over 20,000 Trustpilot reviews. The current national and global challenges are well documented and we are clearly not immune from these. Needless to say, this is quite a challenging micro background with a number of factors outside the direct control of the business. Our business model and disciplines and our ability to generate cash puts us in a strong position to overcome these challenges. Our business performed well during the financial crisis and the subsequent recession. We have seen upward cost pressure from dry goods and inbound freight Whilst important, these are only small components of the overall cost of our wine. The cost of the wine itself and UK duty being by far the two largest components. Over 90% of our wines are exclusive to us. Our flexible approach to sourcing, enabling us to move quickly between different regions to secure high, high quality product, maintain price and continue to offer great value to our customers. We demonstrated throughout COVID that the business can operate effectively with nearly all staff working from home. Our early adoption of hybrid and flexible working protocols enables us to continue to attract and retain high caliber staff. We offer a fun but professional environment to create a great culture across the business and we love what we do. Thanks, Graham. So just moving into some growth opportunities and as we've already mentioned, we're an extremely cash generative business. And as such, this creates the opportunity for us to look at a number of ways we can grow the business over the coming years. M&A is an obvious opportunity and there are an increasing number of businesses that we see coming to market as a period of consolidation occurs post COVID. These opportunities exist right across the various product areas we work within. And we're also keen to understand more about these businesses and explore where there could be synergies, cost savings, expertise to leverage, infrastructure to utilize, or alternative routes to market to exploit, and see where these might play a part in helping to scale our business. While we're in no rush to jump into any of these, and we need to be convinced about the incremental value they would drive, we're also keen to ensure we keep a very close eye on where there may be potential opportunities and to clearly understand how they may or may not fit within our business. Similarly, with international expansion, we've always been open to the potential of moving into other territories if the right conditions exist, and we continue to monitor a number of markets and do thorough due diligence on those territories. We're very aware that there are many pitfalls businesses can fall into when trying to replicate their business models abroad, and we're very respectful of the complexities of doing so. We're therefore doing thorough research of the competitive landscape, the distribution networks, the transferability of our model and the domestic wine market before considering acting on this. But it's an area of opportunity we're keen to understand in detail. I've already talked through the growth we've seen over the past few years in our commercial and gift channels, as well as the development of our beer and spirit product categories. There's clearly further opportunity to invest in growing these areas and this is an ongoing live strategy. We also have the ability to invest further in the core proposition. And if opportunities exist for us to increase our investment in customer marketing and customer acquisition, where we believe we can deliver value, then we're clearly open to doing that as well. And moving on to the on-trade, as a business that creates a huge amount of bespoke and exclusive product while adding value through innovative and aspirational MPD, we see the opportunity to add value to these brands by finding a route to market them in the on-trade. This may well link back into the M&A conversation as we don't currently have the infrastructure to manage this ourselves or the client list to deliver immediate scale. 
but we can see a variety of benefits of seeking product distribution into the premium restaurant or hotel on trade environment. These benefits would include the additional visibility it would give to some of our key wine brands, the knock-on effect of customers who try these wines and then want to purchase them again, being directed to the online business, as well as increasing the perceived pricing of the wines as, and, and opening up a new lucrative sales channel for us. So all opportunities that we believe it's prudent to keep in mind and explore further. Moving on to um, brand and ESG, we're extremely proud of the culture we developed at Virgin Wines, what we stand for as a, as a brand, how we support, motivate and enthuse our people and how we can have a positive impact on the world around us sits high on our list of priorities. We've recently updated our brand DNA document following extensive work with the Virgin Enterprise team and we have a cross-departmental group tasked with incorporating this into our everyday lives and across all touch points in the business as our people adjust to new ways of working in this ever-changing world we live in. At the centre of our brand DNA is our purpose, which is to make people's lives more enjoyable. This is clearly aimed at our customers as we hope that Virgin Wines is a really enjoyable part of their life. But it's also equally relevant for our colleagues and our winemaking partners is this philosophy of ensuring every interaction we ha have with each other as well as with our customers adds value to their lives in a positive way and this is core to our culture. Over the past year we've introduced a free employee assistance program to all staff that offers everything from help with practical matters such as personal finance right through to individual one-to-one -one counselling. We've also developed an internal ESG group that has 14 volunteers from across the business who are particularly passionate about our environment, both inside and outside our business. Everything from creating opportunities for colleagues to meet and interact in a variety of social situations as our teams start the transition to office working again, through to the creation of our new charity wine initiative, the Benevolent Range that you can see on that slide, have been driven by this group. We're also in the process of collecting our scope three data as we look to set ambitious but achievable targets around VSG. And we're currently um, creating an emission reduction roadmap in order to work towards net zero. We'll be articulating our ambitions here in more detail once we finish this first year of collecting our data and we have a clear baseline in place to progress from. However, something that we're continuing to focus on is our initiative of increasing the percentage of wine we bottle in the UK with that being the most immediate factor that we can influence our carbon footprint. And we continue to use Greencroft Estate in Durham as our exclusive bottlers, with themselves being a BRC grade AA plus facility. So moving on to the, the here and now and our outlook, I think it's good to summarize again why we believe we have an outstanding business. We have an extremely robust business model that's proved over the years to be resilient at times of economic volatility as well as able to thrive in more favourable conditions. We have a highly cash generative business that's increased its cash holding by another 5.2 million in the first six months of our last financial year. And we have a variety of potentially attractive opportunity to use this cash to drive growth, both in our core business, as well as looking at a range of other opportunities. In terms of current trading, we've seen strong sales growth continue through our key wine bank subscription scheme our commercial channel continues to grow and we've invested in our other development channels. We have robust plans in place to grow our customer acquisition through scaling our partnership model further, through the optimization, optimization of our digital offering and through our CRM capabilities. And we'll continue to deliver low cost, high quality recruits into the business. Strict margin discipline, the flip flexibility of our open source wine buying model our merchandising capabilities and the efficiency of our operations gives us a variety of tools to be better enabled than most to be able to mitigate much of the impact that current cost pressures and inflation are driving. And we're pleased with current trading with Q3 currently being in line with management expectations. So thank you and we're happy to move on to um, any questions that anyone may have. That's great. Graham, Jay, thank you very much indeed for updating investors this afternoon. Ladies and gentlemen, please do continue to submit your questions using the Q&A tab just on the right-hand corner of your screen. 
Just while Graham and Jay take a few moments to review those questions submitted already, I'd like to remind you that a recording of this presentation, along with a copy of the slides and the published Q&A, can be accessed via your InvestorMeet company dashboard. As usual, I give you absolutely no time, Graham or Jay, to really properly review those questions, and you have, as you can see, received quite a few. So thank you, firstly, to everybody that's uh, submitted questions. Um, but if I may turn to the pre-submitted questions, we received a number, and I think you have touched on them throughout the presentation, but if there's anything further that you feel that you can add. Uh, the first one says, hi, Jay Graham, congrats to you and the team on good results in very difficult circumstances. In the company update, you state that two of the biggest, biggest challenges are, one, delivering high quality, low cost customer acquisition, and two, cost inflation. Could you please go into some detail, a, a bit more than low level, high level will be appreciated about the actions you are taking to mitigate these? And I know you have touched on it, but if there's anything else you could add. Well, if, I'll, if I take customer acquisition and Graham can take the fun subject of, in, of inflation, um, in terms of customer acquisition, uh, yeah, I mean, we, we've, the, for, for customer acquisition to be successful, three, three elements um, need to be, need to be tackled. And, and, and as I've, as I've mentioned, one of those is bringing in the volume of customers, but absolutely essential is to keep the cost per recruit um, low and to keep the quality of customer high. So doing all three of those things in tandem um, is what we focus on doing. We've we've obviously worked extremely hard to try to keep our cost per recruit low, and we, we were budgeting £15.50 for our cost per acquisition this year, and we've achieved £13.62. So I think I think we can, you know, we can we can feel we've done a really good job there. And I think you've seen from the way the conversion rates have um, increased over the course of this last year that we've done a um, hopefully good job in bringing in high quality customers as well. We need to tackle the volume um, issue. And as I think I touched on, the, 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 the way we're looking to do that is to, is to partner with some increasing, um, in, so with, some, with some larger um, size partnerships along the lines of that Daily Mail Wine Club. And it'd be wrong for me to probably talk about potential partners at the moment because we're, we're in conversations with a, with a number but there's some really exciting conversations going on with 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 a, with a number of partners where we think we could have annual marketing plans where there's a variety of different communication channels to access those customers um, and to be able to um, bring in three, four, five thousand customers a year from those particular partners. So I think our our strategy right now is to bring on board over the course of the next few months six or seven of those types of partners which would then give the opportunity to head into fy23 with underpinning the current partnership model that brings in lots and lots of new customers from lots of smaller partners with 25 30 35,000 recruits coming in from larger scale partners to sit underneath that and we feel that's the best way for us to be able to um, continue to scale the customer acquisition whilst maintaining that discipline around around um, low cost and high quality um so so that's really where we're focusing at the moment um as obviously still looking at ways to optimize digital and to and to add um increased recruits from there but they are they are higher cost by the nature of that particular um channel um and on average you know they're, they 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 do convert at a lower level so um it needs to be part of our mix it needs to be something we continue to optimize and continues to grow but it needs to still stay stay in proportion with your overall mix to maintain that low cost high quality ratio so that's the sort of customer acquisition plan on the on the sort of inflation side i mean we we do very much consider inflationary pressure to be sort of business as usual um you know there is always upward pressure it's probably a, a bit harder now than it has been over the last few years but it is something that we are used to dealing with i think um i think one thing to sort of recognize is that um the impact on our sort of core wine pricing um is not as big as maybe some people think because uh packaging dry goods are a relatively small part of the overall cost of a bottle of wine compared to the 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 juice itself that, that makes the wine and and obviously the the uk duty rate which are the two biggest elements of, of, of wine itself um so we're able to um be quite nimble in terms of where we purchase wines from 
the actual core price is more driven by how good the yields and the harvests are and the qualities of, of, of the wines in particular regions. And we're sort of used to dealing with that on a region by region basis. So we will move our purchasing around to the areas where we think there's great value and we can still produce a really quality product for, for our customers. Um, and we want to try to manage the pricing on that so that we're not seeing um, large increases fed through to, to, to our loyal customer base uh, as well. So we're sort of managing that on a day-to-day -day basis as we go along. F FX rates have generally been in our favor still. So although we're seeing some elements of cost increase, the pound, get particularly against the euro, so helping us against wines we're buying in from France, Italy and Spain has, has been in our favour. Um, so that helps mitigate and offset some of the of the inflationary impact as well. Um, and so we've got a very flexible pricing model for our for our products. Um, we 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 premix quite a, a high volume of our own cases that enables us to configure them to um, to hit the margin targets that we're we're trying to deliver for the business, um, so we've got lots of opportunities to sort of mitigate um, rising costs as we go along. That's great. Thank you very much to you both. Um, if I can turn to the next question, it's, it's, it's almost like a, a paragraph, so I'll, I'll condense it really, if I may. Um, over the period, you've added 5.2 million net to the balance sheet and with over 13 million in cash. If one assumes you duplicate this uh, to the financial year end, you'll have almost 20 million in cash. Can you discuss your thoughts about what you're going to do with this cash and what you're going to do with the money? So maybe uh, comments around m and I guess, is, is the, the angle there. Yeah, well, I think first of all, probably best to go back to Graham because because the assumption that we're going to put another five point two million of cash in, in the second half of the year is probably is probably not not correct. So I, I think Graham, do you want to talk about the way that cash is generated in the business over the course of the year and where we're sat now, and that might give a better a bit better. Yeah, j yeah. Just for clarity on that, obviously December is a sort of a high water mark for for cash within within the business because obviously November and December are extremely um, busy months um, and obviously we've got uh, the, the business actually operates on sort of negative working capital so the busier they are, we are the less working capital we need overall and the more cash in the balance sheet so um, we are still expecting to obviously generate good levels of cash across the year our target for June is, is to be around sort of the 13 million pound mark um, which is where we expect it to be obviously we can't generate more cash than we're actually making from operating profit less capex um so we, we will generate significant uh, amount of cash during the year but we're not going to be seeing another five million on top of where we currently are just because of the seasonality flow of, of the business itself that's great thank you very much indeed for clarifying that um, and the final pre-submitted question is really around the supply area and focusing on two areas the first one is sourcing you know with major climatic events in the southern hemisphere uh, hitting vineyards you know are you finding this difficult is that creating uh, an impact for you and secondly around transport particularly around shipping and the current geopolitical situation well, again, if we if, if I sort of take the take the the actual wine making side of it and vineyards and 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 the the I think this is really where the open source buy model comes into its own because we're we're able to um, really go and make our wines um, and create our wines all around the world whenever we want you know wherever we want year after year so we're always looking at where there's the best vintages the best quality the best yields. Um, and then switching more supply to those areas where we can get better quality, better value, because we can make better quality wines at lower at lower cost and therefore um, better value for our customers by doing that. Um, and sort of pivoting away a little bit from areas um, where it's been more tricky and you're maybe getting lower yields, lower quality, higher prices, which obviously in turn doesn't give the customer the best value. So, um, so, so really that complete and total flexibility of wine making that we have um sort of eliminates really an awful lot of the of the complexity that a lot of businesses have who have contracted um relationships with different wineries um around the world where um where, where you almost have to take a um an amount of grapes or amount of wine from a particular um winery year after year so so, so i think that that's how, if that answers the question hopefully and in terms of supply chain, Graham, do you want to just pick up on the 
on, on that part of the question. Um, sorry, Mark, could you just repeat? Yes, it of course. Me? Yeah. So the second part of the supply chain was around the transport and what issues you face around uh, shipping, you know, particularly given the current geopolitical situation. OK, um, we, we saw some issues, particularly in um, in late summer and into autumn uh, of 2021. Um, that was mainly um, lack of uh, container capacity, um, delays in, in, in ships arriving at port. And then when uh, when goods were actually in port, shipping them from the port into us. Um, I think because we had brought forward our purchasing for for peak, um, we had all the stock that we needed in our own warehouses, so it wasn't a particular supply issue for us at that particular point in time. And as, as I touched on earlier, we're actually carrying higher levels of stock than we would normally do to sort of uh, make sure we don't have any ongoing issues with, with that. We have seen the situation improve um, significantly since, uh, since the turn of the year. Um, we're obviously a little bit concerned about whether the 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 uh, the tragic uh, uh, things that are happening in uh, in Ukraine at the moment um, might have a, a further negative impact on that, but it's probably too early to say at, at this point. Um, but we're actually sort of seeing shipping returning to more normal uh, levels. Um, rates have sort of leveled off at the moment, um, subject to obviously what's ha currently happening with energy pricing. And I think, as we touched on before, although it's um, it is an important cost in in our business, it's relatively uh, it's relatively small in overall bottle cost terms. So, for example, the changes that we saw over the last twelve months added about two or three pence on average to the cost of a bottle of wine. So, although there have been sort of much publicised sort of you know containers costing fifteen thousand pounds. Uh, coming out of China, we haven't seen any of that from our freight forwarders. We've just seen sort of normal, um, probably slightly higher than normal price inflation coming through, which is adding a few pence to the to the underlying costs. That's great. Thank you very much indeed, Graham. Well, look, that takes care of the pre-submitted questions. And if I could ask you just to open up the Q&A tab, you yep. see that we've received uh, or you received a considerable number of questions. I don't think you'll have the time of day to go through all of them. But perhaps if I could ask you just to select the ones where you feel it's appropriate, where we maybe haven't touched on and, and give what clarity you can, that'd be great. Yeah, no, no problem. If I could um, ask you also to just read out the questions. Of yeah, I will. Thank I will. you. That, thanks, Mark. Um, so, yeah, we've got a number of questions here. Um, David um, C has asked, how many cases does the average Virgin Wines customer order per year? Um, is this figure consistently the same throughout history or is it trending upwards or downwards? Um, Graham will probably have a better answer than me, but I think we're, we, we, we average about three and a half cases, about three and a half orders per customer per year, but it does vary between the different schemes that people are, um, people are on. So have I got that right, Graham? Yeah, that, that's correct. And, and it's um, over the last two years, it has, has been trending up um, slightly, but 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 not 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 by a major amount. Um, but we are seeing um, effectively what, what we call sort of basket size or order values increase um, as people have the ability to sort of add uh, particularly spirits onto onto wine cases as well. And we also have flexibility of offering um, 15 bottle cases and 16 bottle cases and so we've seen a lot of customers um ordering more in their single case which is obviously good in terms of it minimizes the number of deliveries etc um and and uh and obviously uh, make, make sure they, they can get what they want when they want yeah i mean the um we actually we, we as, as you go through the checkout um process when you order your case you can there's a variety of add-ons that um, that customers can choose as well. Um, Fourteen percent of customers now take an add-on um, on the way through the process. That might be three bottles of rosé or a couple of bottles of prosecco or some beers or whatever it might be. Um, so, so, so the fact that's now increased to fourteen percent. I think if I go back about three years, it was around about eight percent. So, so, so that's increased quite a lot, and that obviously helps all the values too. So, um, and we'll obviously continue to try to um, incentivize that. Um, Another one from um, from David, which said, would you enter new international territories on your own or through partnerships? Um, I, I think it would just sort of depend on the opportunity that, that, 
that were there um david i think um i think if 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 a if there was a existing um player in the market who we felt we could we could team up with and there was good cultural fits and um and it made commercial sense then that would obviously be an opportunity we could look at um so so i think i think in an ideal world that would be that 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 would be a good way of doing it um but i guess we wouldn't entirely rule out doing it on our own but i think probably in partnership would be um would be a first a first choice um i'm just looking through uh, the other questions if you um so how many wine advisors do you employ and what's the customer need to do to qualify for the service um so we employ 44 wine advisors in total um about 50,000 customers enjoy the service of a wine advisor and absolutely anybody can have that service um all they have to do is ask so um there is there's there's no it's a free service um and, and it's available to every single customer so um so 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 yeah that's um if anybody wants a wine advisor just to give our customer service team a call and you'll get one so that's um what's your average bottle price for this period and what was it in the prior period um graham do you want to pick that one up um averages are, are, are approximately eight pounds 50 x fat um again that ha that won't have changed um significantly over the period it might have gone up a few pence but it's been reasonably consistent around that level uh, there's a question here from john um john a who says do you have a stuff share scheme and or did you gift stuff shares at the ipo how are you making sure there's alignment with company aims objectives so um so we have we have um ltip schemes we've got um we've got 24 people within the business um who are on an ltip scheme we are also having a staff um share scheme um like a share save scheme being developed at the moment so that will be available to everybody else there's also um a company-wide bonus scheme in place which aligns everybody on the same on the same objectives and um and that's in that's been in place for a number of years um and and, and all all staff um can get up to 10 percent of their um of their salaries a bonus based on um as achieving various objectives so um so so i think that hopefully we have we have several ways that we can incentivize um, the team um and keep everyone aligned um question again from john about can we talk in a bit more detail about the difficult situation you're having around last christmas um and what will be we be doing to ensure there won't be a repeat this coming christmas i'm 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 guessing you're probably meaning in the warehouse situation and and um i think there's a little bit of a perfect storm um this christmas in terms of there was um an incredible um demand on warehouse labor um this year and i'm sure i think probably that's um that's been extremely widely reported that um at that time of year we need to bring in an awful lot of temporary staff to be able to deal with the amount of additional volume we have um over that sort of eight week period um and, and we've never ever struggled with doing that before it was much more difficult this year um uh actually you know what a a finding that temporary staff to begin with but also retaining them it was it was a, there was an awful lot of wage Com, um competition um around that so that obviously um caused a fair amount of turbulence and then um everyone will 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 be aware the rise of the rise of omicron in the um in the early part of december caused a certain amount of staff um sickness but quite a lot of of of, of self-isolation so that meant there's a lot of staff off over that period um which obviously exacerbated the issues we were seeing so i i, I think there's probably two really major reasons why it was quite difficult um in the warehouse this year I think the fact that we actually managed to do the volume that we did um to um yeah we we, we as graham mentioned we kept we, we, we cut off 48 hours early but we did that because the worst thing we can possibly do is to is to carry on taking orders and then not fulfill and disappoint our customers and um and and customers getting what they ordered when they you know when they when they need it and obviously for christmas being so sensitive then we just took the decision that that was the right thing to do and i i think that was um that proved to be the case because it it, it took us right through the deadline to get everything out the door so um so, so so i'm pleased we took that decision when we did um 
we've got a question here around can we talk about thoughts about the competitive environment in our sector right now um are you seeing distress with competitors um well i think i think we we would always believe that our greatest competition and our greatest opportunity comes from the supermarkets and the grocery sector that's still where um vast vast numbers um of 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 people are buying wine at the price points that we sell at and that's seven eight nine ten eleven twelve pounds a bottle um huge huge amounts of um of wine still being sold for the multiples so we see that as being um the the, the most um the biggest opportunity for us to be able to increase our customer base and engaging with those customers um over christmas they the, the, the multiples are definitely very aggressive in terms of how they use champagne and wine to drive footfall so i think yeah we see that we see that every year um some of our online competitors have been extremely competitive from a price perspective in the um in the acquisition um sector and particularly digitally um i think you quite often can see um some competitors at 19 pounds 99 for six bottles um which is three pounds 33 a bottle um so i think when you put that in perspective and you think what if you take the vat off that um and you realize uk duty is two pounds 26 a bottle um it's um it's very very competitive pricing so um so that's out in the marketplace too um but but i think there's always going to be there's always going to be people who are going to discount and there's always going to be competition um i think our job is to go out there and make sure that we can deliver the, the very best quality the very best value the best customer service um and the and the highest levels of consumer engagement and that's what we focus on doing and i think hopefully the the results that we're delivering back that up um i think i've covered one there about aggressive pricing which was on there too um on another another question from um from john on the beer and spirit side could you just re-explain the model please so are you direct sourcing the product and making this his own label or are you selling third-party products um the answer at the moment john is that we're doing both um to be able to launch the um the beer and the spirit categories um as we did do um we obviously wanted to learn as much as we could about what our customers um would buy um and we wanted to understand what would be popular and what wouldn't so we 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 did um we bought in um, a whole range of products at that point mainly third party so established um established products um and 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 then once we started to get good feedback um from customers in terms of what they were buying um and what they were enjoying and getting some sort of stylistic ideas of what customers wanted we then started to develop our own products and that's really where we're heading so the the the, the strategy over time is to significantly reduce the amount of third party products and significantly increase the amount of exclusive products and that's very much the way that we are we are developing the ranges um I'm just trying to find things where we haven't covered this. There's quite a number of customers with uh, questions that are touching on the same um, on the same area. Um, we've got a question um, here from Guy um, that says, "Do you see any scope for bottles to be returned and reused?" Um, Graham, do you want to sort of talk about that in relation of deposit returns schemes and things? Yeah, obviously there is a, there's consultation going on about deposit return schemes, which obviously we would, as a business that that that, that put glass out into the market, we would obviously have to be be part of. Um, it's um, we have Jay and I in the past have actually looked at a couple of options around this, um, but it's extremely difficult to make it it work in a in a in a decent way. Obviously, we 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 want a hundred percent of everything that goes out there to be fully recycled um, and, if possible, obviously reused in some ways. But it's very very difficult to bring things back through the the carrier network, and then obviously we we don't. Um, have any facilities for actually um, doing anything with glass that so would then need to be moved on um, somewhere else. So it's something that we um, that our ESG group um, have got on their agenda to sort of uh, assess. Um, but it, we, we find it quite a difficult um, concept to sort of work out a, a sensible way of doing it, uh, albeit we, we do appreciate it. So it's something that um, would, would be great if we could find a, a good solution to to work that through 
Jay, I might just jump in just to give you a, a little respite because for every question that you seem to answer, there's another one or two that come in. And <laughs> I am mindful that sometimes you can get a number of questions around the same theme. Uh, obviously, we're coming up to the hour, Jay, and obviously thank you to everyone that submitted the questions. And of course, we'll make any of these questions available to you after the meeting where you feel additional responses may be needed. Um, but I don't know if there's any further, Jay, in that, in that Q&A that you want to touch on. And uh, if not, I, I know investor feedback's important to you and I'll redirect investors to give you their thoughts and expectations. Um, but if there's no further questions that you want to address, then perhaps I could ask you just for a few closing comments. Yeah, no, that's fine. Thank you very much, Mark. And, and, and thank you to everyone who's come along and listened to us today. I hope we managed to answer um, the majority of the questions that came in. And I suppose just to reiterate that I think people know that the trading environment has obviously um, evolved quite considerably. I believe that we have an incredibly robust business model. Um, I think that our subscription schemes um, are performing exceptionally well, which is the which is the foundation that we build the profitability of the business on. We have really exciting development channels that we're investing in, and we have an excellent amount of of cash and and continue to generate large amounts of cash, which we can invest into growth opportunities moving forward. So we feel we've got um, an excellent business with which we're very confident in terms of the growth opportunities, and we hope that um, other people support us as well as we continue to develop the business moving forwards. That's great. Graham, Jay, thank you so much for your time this afternoon and for updating investors. Can I please ask investors not to close this session as we'll now automatically redirect you for the opportunity to provide your feedback in order that the management team can better understand your views and expectations. This will only take a few moments to complete, but I'm sure will be greatly valued by the company. On behalf of the management team of Virgin Wines UK PLC, we'd like to thank you for attending today's presentation. That now concludes today's session. Good afternoon and have a good weekend to you all.